All right, well, this is probably the one thing that we've done before that isn't new to um, working remotely, except that my backdrop is not nearly as professional. Don't judge the books on the bookshelf. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Jennifer Smith. I'm Director of Government Relations for the Michigan Association of School Boards, and I will be running uh, today's Views from the Capitol. Um, you are all muted now to try to cut down on background noise and echoes. If we call on you to speak, you can unmute yourself or we will try to unmute you as well. Also with me is Jeff Cobb, Assistant Director of Government Relations. He's going to act as moderator for the question and answer time. He'll be watching the chat for your questions and watching for raised hands. And we'll get into a little bit of that if you haven't done it before in just a minute. And also with us is Deshondre Bedenfield, our grassroots coordinator and policy analyst for MASB. And she is going to keep an eye on our tech, make sure it's working, make sure people are getting in. And as we talk about um, possible uh, websites to check, she'll make sure that those show up in the chat. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this is a very special view from the Capitol, but isn't everything different and special these days? Um, what I want to go through today is focus on COVID-19 and how it's been affecting schools, the EOs, and different things like that. I'll cover the most recent EO, EO 35, which ended face-to-face -face instruction in schools. And um, I think a lot of the questions that have been coming to us have been answered or at least addressed by that EO. So I'm gonna go through that in fairly good detail and then we'll take um, some question and answers at the end after that. Um, you can put your questions into the chat box, which you can find a chat box at the bottom of your screen if you're on the computer or if you are only on the phone, if you uh, type star nine, it will raise your hand um, and then when we get to that point, Jeff will be able to call on you and unmute you um, for you to be able to ask your question. Um, we're gonna try to keep this to an hour because I know some of you are truly still working from home. If we still have questions going, we will keep going as long as we can try to answer your questions. But we do understand that after an hour or so, if you have to drop off, that's fine. We are recording today's session, so it should be available on our website, um, hopefully tomorrow. So just to start, like, and sort of how did we get here? And a lot of this probably heard, but it's sort of nice to put it in a timeline as we start talking about where, where we go next. So as of yesterday, April 6th, Michigan had 17,221 confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 727 deaths. We only had our first case on March 10th. So in three weeks, we have seen this skyrocket. On March 10th was when the state of emergency was declared by the governor when our first two cases were confirmed. On March 12th at 11 o'clock at night, um, the governor ordered all school buildings to be closed to face-to-face -face instruction. On March 23rd, we got the stay at home, stay safe, save lives order that we are currently under, and we are under until April 13th at midnight. Um, this is for necessary and essential um, travel only. On April 2nd, we got the latest EO number 35, which ended face-to-face -face instruction in schools. That's obviously what we're here to talk about today. The legislature did meet today or is meeting. The Senate met this morning. They only brought in enough people to make a quorum. So 20 senators came in. Um, hold one second while I tell them. Um, there's a join audio button if you don't have audio. Let me get that to everybody. Sorry for this. Like, please understand the technical <laughs> issues as we all this. Um, so the legislature came in today, the Senate brought in 20 senators, um, that was all, to come in to do, um, to do a voice vote on Senate Concurrent Resolution 24. This concurrent resolution allows the emergency declaration to extend past the 28 days that is allowed for the governor. So they extended it until April 30th. The governor had asked for longer, days. Um, the Emergency declaration allows her to do these to make these decisions without um, having to go to the legislature for everything. 
Um, so that was passed by the Senate this morning on a voice vote. The House also came in at 10 o'clock and um, they are still taking attendance. They have set it up so that they are having five people come into the chamber at a time. They register their attendance and leave and they bring in the next five people. They've asked representatives to stay in their cars or to stay outside until they are called into the building. So it is taking them quite some time to be able to, um, to take attendance this morning. Laws and the Constitution require them to be present to vote. So they are looking into this to see if there's some way they can do it virtually, but right now it is not allowed. They have to physically show up to do it. Um, part of this goes with only the senator can, or only the representative can push their vote button. So they have to actually be there to do it. This is the same at the federal level as well. So we don't know, and I know people are looking into it, as I said, we don't know if they can do it virtually. Um, so right now they're going to great lengths to try to keep um, the legislators safe. Everyone in the Senate, the 18 that they brought in or the 20 they brought in today were spread throughout the chamber. They didn't have to sit at their own desk. They made sure they all maintained their six feet um, difference. The staff was cut in half. There was no office staff. It was only Senate staff. Um, they came in, they took attendance by voice. They took the voice vote and uh, then they adjourned. They were in and out in probably 15 minutes. Um, and like I said, the House is taking these steps to only have five people in the chamber plus the, the um, only essential staff. They will do a voice vote as well. That voice vote is only going to uh, be from leadership. Um, this has all been agreed to by both parties um, in order to try to maintain safety, especially in the House because we have three House members, two House members that are confirmed um, COVID-19 and one who unfortunately passed away last week um, suspected of COVID-19. So the House is a lot more nervous um, about this than the Senate is. Um, but a lot of that leads into why hasn't the legislature done something or why couldn't they do something? And some of that is safety. Um, so EO35 addressed a lot of the things that we were going to ask the legislature to do. The governor has said that we may not hit the apex of this disease until May. She is looking into extending the stay home, stay safe order, but is not sure what that will entail at this point. Um, in her latest press conference, she said they're looking at it. They just don't know how long they will extend it for. But I would expect something on that in the next week or so. So are there any questions on that stuff before we get into the meat of the EO? There, there's a question on third party contracted employees, but I think maybe we can deal with that after we go through your presentation. Yep, we'll get into that. Okay, so many of the questions, as I mentioned, over the last three and a half weeks were answered by the executive order or at least addressed. Um, MASB and our fellow ed organizations, MASA, MASSP, the various ISDs, we have all been man maintaining since the day this happened, we've been maintaining a list of questions that we have shared with the governor's office and MDE in sort of an active living document. We can add, add the questions, they can address them, or at least they flag them then for to address. Um, so anything that I can't answer for you today is going to be added to that list to get back to um, them. I will cover the EO and some of the questions I've received, but first I just want to say thank you not only for joining us today to learn um, or to be able to ask questions, but just for all you're doing over these last few weeks. This is unprecedented and I know as board members, not only do you have your districts to worry about, but many of you have actual jobs on top of your volunteer board job. And I'm sure that none of this is easy. Um, so we really appreciate all you're doing for your districts. Um, if there's ever more that we can do for you, please let MASB know. And uh, we thank you for your patience too, because there's a lot more questions than there are answers right now. So EO 2020-35 ended face-to-face -face instruction for the 1920 school year. It also waives days and hours for that time, for uh, 13 additional days. So you will get the six days that are currently in law and then an additional 13 days due to closures for, uh, for COVID-19, giving you a total of 19 days for the school year. So if any of your snow days were in those six days, 
you're not getting additional six. Those six are from the original law and then the 13 are additional. You can also, under current law, you can count five days as uh, five days of PD as instructional time. She's added to that an additional five days of PD for instructional time. Um, so you can have a total of 10. The 75% daily attendance requirement is waived beginning on March 11th, the first school day after the um, emergency declaration. We know that there are schools that struggle to get 75% attendance in those, day, those three days before she closed school. And especially on that Friday when she had announced it Thursday night, we know some districts struggled with that for Friday. So we were happy to see her go all the way back to the 11th to waive that 75% attendance. You will be required, as you know, to create a continuity of learning plan. And this is gonna cover how you will deliver instruction um, to students for the remainder of your school year. There are a lot of details about what has to be included in that plan. Um, and I know some districts have already started to um, put that together. Once it's put together, it has to be submitted to the ISD and the ISD will approve, then it's submitted to the state. Once you have an approved plan on file with the state, then your um, payments, your school aid payments continue as if you were in a regular school year. So within that plan, um, you are expected to start to implement it as soon as it is approved. It must be approved and implementation start by April 28th. The plan has to include a sub plan for high school seniors and how you'll handle graduation with a process to certify that students have completed the Michigan Merit Curriculum requirements. However, districts have, um, have discretion on figuring out how those credits are fulfilled and um, determining final grades so that the seniors that are graduating will have final grades on their transcripts. The district's plan should aim to the best of their ability to support IEPs and 504 plans um, we need to consider the stay home, stay safe, save lives executive order. There is also a lot of guidance that has come out of the US Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights on this issue. And we do expect more guidance coming out of MDE in the coming days. If the plan relies on online instruction, the district must ensure that every student has access to a device that can connect to the internet. We know that this is probably the biggest problem facing districts is connectivity, devices in homes, and whether or not you even have reliable internet that goes to all of your homes. So the idea behind this plan is to make it as flexible as possible, that you don't have to go to just online learning. It can be a mix of online learning, of take home packets, of however you wanna be able to put it together to best address what your students need and the best way to get it to those students. The SAT will be offered to this year's juniors next fall when they are seniors, and same with the PSAT. Um, food distribution is, is required to eligible students through the end of your school year calendar. Um, one of the questions was, do we have to supply through June 30th? And the answer was no, it is through the, the last day of your school year. Um, work in buildings can occur to facilitate distance learning. However, this is only for people who need to be in the building for those purposes. Um, you can allow parents to come in to pick up things, but social distancing has to be practiced. The stay home safe, stay safe order needs to be um, followed to the best of your ability. So you can't have people congregating in your buildings but if you need to access the internet in there to get your lesson plan out, or you need to go in to compile things, those employees would be allowed in the buildings, but no one is allowed in the building just because. Uh, the EO also includes a provision that MIPSERS will continue to be, um, credits will not be impacted, they will continue to accrue. Um, mental health services are required to the best of your ability. Um, as well as supporting ISD efforts to create those mobile disaster relief child centers that was created through another EO. Those child care centers are aimed at um, basically our front line, the, the medical, the people, essential employees who have to work um, to create a daycare space for those kids so that those essential employees can still um, go to work. ISDs are not required to create the daycare, but they do need to be supportive of it 
and they are the um, they should be there as a last resort. K through 11 students will advance to their next grade as long as they were on pace to do so as of March 11th. Also, if you have a student who was failing or on that borderline, efforts must be made to assist that student in getting the makeup work or the work they need to be able to advance to the next grade. The third grade reading law, the retention piece of that will not be enforced this year. Assessments have been waived through the Every Student or Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Element Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, the feds have come back with waivers for that. Um, so none of those assessments will be required federally. And the state is now following that. They will not be required at the state level either. This affects numerous laws that will also not be enforced because we're not doing assessments. So that includes the K-3 reading. It includes um, all of your uh, superintendent evaluations as well as staff evaluations. Um, it includes A to F grades. Um, anything that was based on an assessment is not going to be enforced this year. Um, you will be able to adopt a balanced calendar for the rest of this year. That is if the order to stay home is lifted. Um, and we are able to safely go back into buildings. If you wanted to adopt a balanced calendar to finish this year, you would be able to do that. The Labor Day start ban is lifted for next year. So if you don't have a waiver to start before Labor Day, you would be able to do that without having to apply for a waiver. Um, there's also a provision included that encourages districts to donate PPE, cleaning supplies, and other materials to um, emergency services. There had been some question with some CTE programs and some schools that have 3D printers and are able to make some of these things, if they would then be able to donate it. And there were questions that legally that wasn't really allowed. And so this clarifies that yes, that is allowed in the time being while this EO is um, in effect. Um, so that's sort of some of the highlights, lowlights, whatever you wanna call them from this executive order. Um, it does also speak to paying staff, that staff shall be paid um, and redeployed as possible so that um, people can keep working. Um, this falls under some of your meal distribution. It can fall under some of your packet distribution, whatever you may need those people for. Um, the plan also has to include um, not only how you're going to deliver the content to various age groups and various populations, but how you're going to manage and monitor it and how you included your, um, how you are, were included in the process with your superintendents, administrators, teachers, um, all of that, trying to make this plan as collaborative as possible. Um, the date um, on when you have to start your plan, as I mentioned, is no later than April 28th, but the goal would be as soon as you are able. And this applies to all schools. It applies to all public, private, um, and charter schools. For the charter schools, they can either go to the ISD for approval or to the authorizer. There is a, um, a template already out there um, on MDE's website, um, MAISA, the charter authorizers, um, all of them have the template of the plan available. We'll put it up on our website as well. Um, MASA has it on their website. <clears throat> the template um, is basically a fill in the blank on how you're going to take care of this and all the different boxes you need to check. Um, and then that can be submitted to your ISD and signed off on. A district is allowed to contract with a provider if you need to with, for the implementation of a plan, um, or you can partner with one or more districts. Um, ISDs have the same ability to contract with other ISDs if necessary in order to be able to do these plans. Um, an ISD is to approve the plan as long as all the boxes are checked. Um, this is not to nitpick. Um, it is not to be very strict in our um, in our definitions or intent of this EO. The governor has said repeatedly the idea behind this EO is to push for that continued learning, but
but in the way that works best for your district. So there are a lot of things that are not spelled out because that's gonna be allowed um, to be taken care of at the district level. You are allowed to amend your plan as necessary. Um, decisions regarding awarding of credits, the issuance of grades, using credit, no credit, or pass-fail designations is all up to the local district to determine. There have been some questions if you're allowed to do that for seniors. The governor has, has said yes, this is for all students. Um, there's also a section that deals directly with non-publics and homeschooling so that they have um, direction as well because there is obviously not a strict and not as many laws we have to wait for them because um, there are pages of laws that are waived, but there is a section that deals directly with them. Um, as I mentioned, the district employees permitted in district buildings are essential only. Um, you can allow people in your district. If you have parents that need to get in to pick up packets or say empty locker, um, that can be allowed as long as social distancing is followed. Um, all of the various assessments, as I mentioned, are waived, um, as well as the requirement that you take one civics class, that is gone. The requirement for MME to be taken this year is gone. Um, the WIDA access, um, that requirement is waived for this year. Uh, the kindergarten readiness assessment is waived for this year. Um, and then for IEPs that require face-to-face -face, um, evaluation, that deadline has been extended so that you don't have to do the face-to-face -face under these um, social distancing requirements. Uh, so there's a lot, a big section of this is based on special ed and a lot of it is looking toward the U.S. Office of Civil Rights. Um, DOE has put out a lot of guidance, Civil Rights has put out some guidance, but there are a lot of things that we want to make sure we are not in um, direct um, conflict with OCR because the last thing we want is to one, harm those students and two, um, put districts in a place where they're going to be sued. So a lot of care was taken with this section um, it's a lot of do the best you can with those students while doing um, social distancing um, to determine if you need a compensatory plan when students come back to face-to-face -face learning. Um, and so there's, a, there's still a lot of questions there and we do expect more guidance. We're hoping to get more out of OCR directly. There's a section that deals with your teachers and um, teacher certification. So if you have teachers whose cert, who cert certificate expires this year, that can be extended for one year. If you had teachers who were on a one-year extension, um, that you can choose to extend for another year um, just to get around this time. And that's if um, teachers were not able to get their, uh, all of their PD done or all of their continuing learning plans. Um, there is flexibility there to allow those teachers to continue to teach. Um, their specialty certifications will continue, counselor certifications continue, um, with the understanding that when this is lifted, we need to make efforts to get um, back to where we need, back to those credits. But right now, if you can't get those credits taken care of, you won't be penalized for them. Um, the, there is a statement that says for a district with a collective bargaining agreement, the order must be implemented by the district in a manner consistent with the collective bargaining agreement. One of the biggest questions we keep getting is about the contract employees and the EO is intentionally silent on those. Um, we have been talking to law firms and with Brad Benassic, MASB's legal counsel on how those should be dealt with. I don't have a good answer for you today. Um, we are still working on that. Um, Brad is actually going to be doing a webinar as well, uh, focusing on more of the legal issues. This would be one of them. This would be a great question for him. Um, I don't have a solid answer on what to do. A lot of what we keep being told is the district should decide, um, but I know that's not the answer people are looking for. So the guidance isn't really out there yet. We've been asking, we we're talking to people, and we hope to have a better, more clear answer soon, or at least as clear as we can get for you. Um, but I would urge for questions, especially around the CBAs, 
um, to reach out to Brad in our office, um, you can do that through me or to tune into his webinar. Um, information about that should be coming out today, um, but he will be doing a webinar on, on Friday. So the other big question is what happens with the budget? And as you know, we, they passed a law last year that said they have to have their budget done by July 1. And we're not sure that's gonna happen anymore. Part of that goes back to what I mentioned about the legislature not being able to meet virtually. Um, conversations obviously are happening behind the scenes, but they can't come together to have committee hearings. They can't come together to vote these budgets out. And the other piece in this is the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference. Normally in our budget cycle, we would have budgets from each chamber and the governor's budget done before the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference. Then they wait for that, which happens in early May. And those are the numbers that they use with the Senate, the House, and Treasury agreeing on revenues for the coming year. Those are generally the numbers they use to go forward to create their targets and to create the final budget. This year, we know the January Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference and the May Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference are going to look very, very different. And so there is a lot of nervousness about what those numbers are gonna look like in May. Um, how big of a hit is this going to be on our state? We have heard you know, upwards of a billion, billion and a half in lost revenue in sales, um, business taxes, income taxes, all of that. Um, so the May Revenue Estimating Conference is going to be um, probably where budget talks restart because um, we have to start over. The governor has said uh, that her goal would be to push as much money as possible into the per pupil um, to try to keep an increase there, to try to keep uh, money flowing to the districts. We also don't know what the feds are going to do. There has been one stimulus package that has passed. We certainly don't think that is the last. And we don't know from those stimulus packages how much is going to be state aid. Um, we've heard you know, personal aid to families, um, if it's going to have strings attached, if it's going to be to specific departments, we just don't know. And so until we see some of those things um, come through, we're not going to know what our budget numbers are. Um, but there is, there's a lot of fear out there right now. Some of the rumors are that we're going to be prorated for this year. We don't think that is a possibility. We think the budget is solid for this year. We will get through this fiscal year. And for next year though, we may not be able to see a per pupil increase. And if things go very south, you can see a per pupil decrease. So while I don't think proration is on the table for this year, next year could be ugly. And so that's something to keep in mind as you're at the budget table. Um, I don't have advice on how to budget because we really don't have any idea. And I hate saying that because I told you all last budget cycle that this year I was gonna be able to give you better news and more concrete numbers and now I can't. So I'm back to the same words we were saying last year. We just don't know. It's just this year, it is completely out of everyone's control. It's not um, a political issue. This is really just an economic issue. And so we're waiting along with everyone else. We have been in, in touch with our various chairs, um, but all of those conversations have shifted to from what we would like to see in the budget to what is necessary in the budget. And so those are the things that we're talking about now. Um, if we get any word on budget movement, we will certainly let you know, but I wouldn't expect to hear anything until after the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference, which I think is the second week of May, but I'm not sure if that has been scheduled yet. So there are two other um, executive orders that I'd like to know. Um, one came out a week or so ago, all my days run together, so forgive me if I'm off. Um, this would allow for school board members and local boards to meet remotely as long as they are still allowing for um, public participation. We have a lengthy Q&A that Brad has done on our website that answers a lot of the questions I think you'd have around that. Um, the second EO came out Sunday night late and this extended FOIA deadlines so that if you have to physically enter a building, an office, whatever the case may be, to comply with a FOIA request, 
the deadlines for that have been extended out to June. Um, if it is not, if you don't have to physically go after it, then the deadlines still exist. But again, we have a frequently asked questions on that as well. Um, Brad is going to be recording his webinar. So if you have questions, he's mentioned this in the chat as well. Um, he's recording tomorrow. It will be available on Friday. So any questions you have on either of those that aren't answered by the FAQ on our website, um, please send those to Brad or you can send them to me and I'll forward them on. Um, but make sure that we get them to him before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. With that, I think I up to your questions. And I, like I said, I will do my best to answer them. If I don't know, um, we'll try to find out. And um, that's going to have to be my answer to some of the questions. I apologize ahead of time. But I'm going to turn it to you, Jeff. And what questions do we have? Sure. Um, one of the questions came up is, what's going on with the High School Athletic Association? How does that impact what's going on, you know, will, in terms of, you know, if, if, if they decide to, uh, you know, how they're going to deal with um, grades and participation and what happens if they try to go into the summer and have their sports? I don't, do you have any information on that? Um, so the Michigan High School Athletic Association put out a statement within a day or two of Executive Order 35, um, canceling all winter and spring sports. So if you remember when this first happened, there was question if some of the state and district um, events would still happen um, and if they would try to do those when we could come back to school. Those have been canceled, so there will be no um, district or state championships this year for winter sports. And for spring sports, the season has been canceled completely. Um, some of the questions I've gotten to around that have been with club sports, but I would fully expect club sports to follow the lead of the MHSAA. And also you can't have groups of kids on a field playing ball right now of any kind. Um, so club sports, I would count as canceled as well. As far as grades, um, we haven't heard from them specifically. But knowing that the districts can control or have discretion over how they do the grades, um, we'll start over in the fall with um, eligibility. So I don't think the spring will affect fall sports. The other thing we are hearing is NCAA and we haven't gotten guidance from them yet, but NCAA has a general rule that credit, no credit counts as a D for grade point averages. So for our seniors that are going into college to play sports, this is gonna have an effect. Uh, we have reached out, um, MHSAA has, um, and just in conversations, I know the governor's office has, uh, reached out to universities and to the NCAA to say, you know, this isn't a Michigan issue. This is a, a nationwide issue. And this would be a great time for NCAA to maybe suspend that rule on credit, no credit, being a D. We haven't heard back from them for sure yet, um, but we're hopeful that they will acknowledge that this is a problem for graduating seniors that are supposed to play in the fall, um, as far as the grade point average that they are coming into college with. That's as much as I know about. Okay. Um one question was, uh, do, does the school board have to approve this continuity of learning plan or is it done through this superintendent? The EO is not specific that the school board has to approve. It does say the school board needs to be involved. Um, so that would be a conversation to have with your superintendent. We are hoping this is done collaboratively with the superintendent, the school board, the school staff. Um, we really don't want to, to have contentious conversations, um, but it is not required that the school board approve. I think the reason, and I don't know for sure, but I think the reason is that approval would require the school board to meet and approve officially, and that takes time, meeting postings, public meetings. We have boards that just, they don't have the ability to do that and have the, have the public um, involved. And so in order to avoid that, it was not required that the board approve, but the board should be involved in um, 
some of the bigger questions and bigger issues with that plan. When it comes down to the details of curriculum and grade granting and things like that, those are discussions that the superintendent should be having with your curriculum director. Um, but the board should, should definitely be aware of um, where those conversations are going. Can, can the board meet right while the uh, shelter in place is, in or is going? Can they meet in person or do they have to do it virtually? You may not meet in person. Um, the shelter in place, the stay home, stay safe order does not allow you to meet. Um, you can meet virtually. That's what the EO allows is that, which was always a question about, um, about whether or not school boards could meet virtually. This was cleared up in an EO. That's the uh, frequently asked questions document that I would point you to MASB's site. We have a site specific, a page specific to COVID-19 at masb.org slash COVID-19. Um, and it has all of the resources, everything we've done, everything MDE has put out, anything else that we've been able to get our hands on is all there. And that's where you'll find the FAQ. So you can meet remotely. Um, you can meet as we're doing now, but you have to have a way for the public to participate. Um, otherwise, it is a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, we have one district that authorizes a charter school. What's the district's role then in approving the charter's continuity plan? It would either go to the authorizer, which is the district, or up to the ISD. Um, in that case, that may be a better one to go to the ISD since the district's plan is going to the ISD. Uh, but I would be in contact with your ISD um, and with you know, both that charter and your board to figure that out. Um, that's a pretty specific question um, that I'm not 100% clear on the answer, but if the board is authorizing the charter, it would fall under your district. And so that plan would have to flow up to the ISD for approval. Okay. Um, do the requirements for developing a, con a continu continuity of learning plan apply to the private schools? And if so, why, or if not, why? So there is a section in the plan. Let me find it real quick. Um, I had it a minute ago. But there's a section in the plan that goes directly to privates and uh, homeschooling and lays out their expectations. Um, it's taking me just a minute to find it, bear with me. It's a long order. Um, I'm not finding it. Okay, um, if you happen to read the long order, it's on page seven, but it, um, it does say state approved non-public and parents and guardians homeschooling are encouraged to do all the following. And it lays out their steps as well to offer students electronic or other remote home-based instruction to the extent feasible, including through MBU if necessary, um, to coordinate with districts providing non-essential elective courses. So shared time is still allowed under this um, under the EO, so they can still participate in that if the district is still um, offering it. Um, assisting with dual enrollment and CTE, which is also under the EO for every other school there to help make those, um, those opportunities available to the extent possible through dual enrollment and CTE. And then um, they have to take actions necessary to continue to receive any federal funding previously allocated in a manner applicable with federal law. So it's not a lot for them, um, but just more encouragement that they also continue to do instruction um, through the end of their school year. Okay. Um, in terms of doing the staff evaluations, uh, we know that the um, assessments for the state have been waived, but uh, do the evaluations still need to be consistent with the collective bargaining agreement? There is a piece there that has to be figured out. So law 
state law does not require you to do the evaluations, but we know there are collective bargaining agreements that do require it. This question came up in a webinar I was on the other day and there was not a clear answer to that yet, um, but it, is, it has been flagged as something we need to look into. It also may be something that you need to talk to your, um, your bargaining unit and your, um, your local legal representation as well. That may also be a good question to send to Brad for his um, webinar, although I'm not sure that he has guidance on that either. Um, you mentioned something about food distribution. Does that have to go through the end of the year? What are the requirements for food distribution? Currently, food distribution will be required through the end of the school year, not through the end of the school fiscal year. Um, and MDE has more guidance on that coming out. Um, they also have a series of webinars that are coming out. Um, this has been probably the most talked about at MDE issue. So you can find a lot of information on it on their website. But from the information I received yesterday, food distribution to eligible families, eligible students is required through the end of your school calendar, um, but not the fiscal year. Um, we had a question about how the CARES Act, uh, how its passage would impact our budget next year. Um, that's a very good question. Um, Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about what the CARES Act? Sure. So the CARES Act, uh, it was passed maybe a week or two ago. Um, it does distribute money to the states for education. Uh, looking at the, uh, at the analysis of the bill, it looks like Michigan would get about 389 million. And then we would also, the governor would get another 89 million to kind of spend on education issues. So together that's, you know, 480 million, um, which will definitely help. Uh, we're inclined to think that more is needed at the federal level to help. Um, there was nothing uh, done in terms of granting any kind of waivers for um, IDEA and um, so there, there's some definitely some issues that need to be resolved still federally uh, but the the money we are going to get some money from the federal government and it will help fill some of the lost revenue that we're going to see. Thanks Jeff. Um, okay going back to athletics do the districts need to pay their spring coaches? That has come up um, I believe, and I don't have all the answers, if it is a stipend that they would have received for doing the coaching, that is not required. If you have outside coaches, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that, but the, the question has been asked. Um, I just don't have a lot of clarity. Okay. Um. The ISDs are being told, they have to approve the plan for the districts and they're being told to be sort of flexible and give each district a lot of grace. But at what point are ISDs going to be held liable if services aren't delivered since they signed off on the plan? That's been a question as well, like who's in charge of enforcing the plan? Um, we think that'll be part of a Q&A that's coming out from the governor's office, hopefully this week. It would seem that the ISDs would be in charge of making sure the plan is being followed, but at the same time, the governor has said that we're, we're not trying to be punitive here. So we don't wanna be punitive on parents who can't or don't participate. We don't wanna be punitive on districts that are doing the best they can. And so I would imagine that would extend to ISDs that we don't want to um, be punitive to them as well. Um, but the idea of who's in charge of making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing is a question that's, um, that's hanging out there. Okay. Um, I think that answers uh, the majority of the questions. Um, I, I know that uh, some of the questions we'll be able to respond to through email later on. We'll have to do, look into some of the issues and we will get back to those. We'll be saving this chat so we will have the questions available to us to help respond. Um, we did get another uh, something post um, from Shelly uh, Haas. For teachers with a one-year temporary authorization on an expiring certificate, 
Is it the district that applies for the extension or is it the responsibility of the teachers to reach out to MDE? Let me double check. I believe um, I believe that the requirement for the expiring certificate is waived. So it would not matter. Okay, here it is. Um, yes, yeah, strict compliance with the rules and procedures is, an, is waived. So the superintendent, I believe the state superintendent can extend the duration of the one year temporary teacher employment authorization. Um, same with the interim teaching certificates. The superintendent is permitted to, to issue those or to extend those in both um, teaching areas and uh, just overall teaching certificates, but we will double check um, that's probably part of what's coming out of NDE guidance, but we will add that to the question as to um, who isn't who needs to reach out the district or the teacher. Um, and one more time, we got another question about third party contracted employees. I think you mentioned this a little bit when you were going through your presentation, but can you give a little more clarity on that? Sure, I wish I could. Um, the EO is intentionally silent on contracted employees. The webinar I was on with the governor um, a couple of days ago or yesterday, she said that, um, and her policy staff had stated that this was intentional because everyone handles their contracts differently. Um, the number of employees you have contracted is probably different district to district. So they did not speak to it. Um, this is definitely a question that has come up. Um, it's a question that we will float to Brad for his webinar on Friday because it does fall a little bit more in that legal realm and uh, a question that we've been asking for clarity on. So I don't have much I can share, unfortunately, but this is a big question. It's been repeated a lot. So we'll see what we can, what we can figure out. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any other questions. If anybody has other questions, they can email it to either Jen or myself. Um, and again, the, uh, this will be posted on the MASB website, uh, probably by tomorrow afternoon sometime. Um, and we are available. Um, thank you very much for coming. And in closing, I just wanna thank you all again for everything you're doing. And I know as school board members, um, You've got a lot on your plate, both personally, professionally, and as a board member. Um, and on a personal note, I just want to say, um, be patient with yourself, be patient with those that you are quarantined with, um, and grant yourself some grace. I think that's the best advice I've gotten over these last few weeks, is to grant yourself some grace. We're all in this together. Um, nobody knows what's going on, nobody knows what to do, and certainly no one is perfect. So hang in there, be safe, be healthy, wash your hands, reach out if you need anything from us or you just wanna chat for a second. Um, and we thank you for joining us.